like to send a quick thank you to the people who provide funding for the Canadian Cochrane Centre, which allows us to conduct these webinars. I'd like to thank the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the six institutes that are listed there. Without their support, these webinars wouldn't be happening. I'd like to send a special thank you to PAHO and WHO, that is the Pan American Health Organization, which is the regional office of the World Health Organization. They're providing us with the software so that we can provide these webinars free of charge. Can I ask everybody to send a quick round of applause through to PAHO using your emoticons on your screen? A round of applause through to PAHO. Thank you very much, everybody. So today's session is doing a risk of bias assessment of RCTs, or randomized control trials, in Cochrane Reviews. And today's session is going to be led by Lucy Turner. Lucy is one of our expert presenters who is based in Ottawa at the Ottawa Method Centre, part of the Knowledge Synthesis team. Her statistical work ranges from analysis of survey data to meta-regression and cumulative meta-analysis. If you have any questions about statistics or the risk of bias, Lucy is certainly the person to go to. She's a research coordinator for the Cochrane Bias Methods Group. So Lucy, thank you so much for presenting today and I'm going to turn it over to you to go ahead. Hi, Erin. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. As Erin said, uh, my name is Lucy Turner. My background is in statistics. I've been coordinating the Cochrane Bias Methods Group for about three years now, uh, working with David Moe's Knowledge Synthesis Group here in Oslo, in Canada. Um, please, if you're having any difficulty hearing me, please let me know. Um, also, I do have a tendency to speak a little quickly. So if I'm going too fast, particularly for those whose language, first language isn't English, uh, please do let me know. Um, any feedback is welcome, so please don't he hesitate to mention uh, that. So, uh, using the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool, is this session is going to be a, a practical example, and we'll give you a bit of a session overview in just a minute. As you'll have access to these slides, um, I thought it was important um, to have an introductory slide with additional material uh, that would be helpful to you perhaps afterwards. Um, it's definitely not possible to learn how to conduct a risk of bias assessment within an hour, but hopefully we can give a very good overview um, and these additional resources um, are here and hopefully will be able to help you in the future prior to doing your uh, risk of bias assessment. Erin, I'm just wondering if we could have um, an impromptu poll right now just to see how many people have used the risk of bias tool before. Thanks, Lucy. So I'm just setting up a poll right now. If I could ask you to just wait one moment. There we go. And if you could use the polling function, yes or no. Send through a yes or no if you have used the risk of bias tool. And we'll give just a moment for those responses to come through. And then I'll publish them to the whiteboard, Lucy. Thank you, Erin. Sorry, that was a little off the cuff. Thank you. Um, so just in terms of the Cochrane Handbook, it's readily available online. There are some changes that will be coming through in the next little while. Um, so it's a good idea to always um, check out the, the handbook prior to conducting your risk of bias assessments as there will be some modifications, some minor modifications now um, and some larger scale modifications that will be coming through in the next couple of years. Okay, so it's interesting to see the results of the poll. Quite a few people, 32% of people haven't used uh, the, the risk of bias tool before. Um, and it's quite evenly split, so, so that's good. Um, of those 18 people who didn't respond, um, you know, I'll err on the side of, of, of a no. Um, sorry if the poll isn't, isn't working for you. There are also training slides available um, via the training working group. Thanks to them for organizing those and setting those up. There are comprehensive slides that go through um, how to assess risk of bias, and they also go through reporting biases. Um, so that those are very helpful resources. And please do always um, feel free to get in touch either by going to the BMG website, which has a number of online um, papers and references which may be of interest to you. And you can always contact us directly, and my email address is there. So just quickly, um, my own acknowledgments to the Bias Methods Group conveners. Um, Professor Altman, um, Dr. Bouchon and Robertson, 
and uh, Dr. David Moore, who have given input to these slides and continue to do a lot of work for our group. Also, thanks to Miranda Compton, um, who, who developed a suite of the standardized training slides. Um, we also share the same funders um, for those who, who fund the webinar. So thanks to CIHR. In terms of the session overview, as I mentioned, it's very challenging to teach risk of bias within an hour. Um, sometimes we have two-day sessions, and um, we can get through and um, into the nitty-gritty a bit more thoroughly. So what we're planning to use today is to work through an example, which hopefully you will have in front of you, a fairly short, um, concise example, and hopefully it will give us a good introduction to conducting a risk of bias assessment. We will not cover anything on reporting biases today, and we will not cover anything on assessment for non-randomized control trials today. Um, you may be interested to know that the BMG um, is currently working on sort of a three-pronged process to updating the way that we assess risk of bias in Cochrane reviews. The first will be um, risk of bias 2.0, which will be somewhat of a form format change. I'm not sure what that means. Okay. Uh, which will be somewhat of a format change. Um, and then there's also a group of people at the University of Liverpool uh, working in conjunction with the BMG um, assessing reporting bias and particularly selective reporting. There's some work going on there. And there is a huge initiative um, that's going on at the moment which involves over 50 uh, senior methodologists who are developing a suite of tools in extension to this current version of the risk of bias tool for assessment of non-randomized study. We also won't cover in great detail other issues um, with regards to bias assessment today, um, but they will be detailed in the soon to be updated version of the handbook. So in terms of steps of a Cochrane review, where are we with this process? Um, so you've gone through your, your screening, you've identified your studies, um, you've collected your data, um, and now you're assessing your studies with potential risk of bias. These are fairly interchangeable um, with data extraction. You can do it simultaneously. You can ask um, two people on your team to do data extraction, two people on your team to do risk of bias assessment. We do um, suggest that risk of bias is conducted independently and in duplicate hopefully with a methodologist and a clinician in combination. Um, as clinicians, sometimes are able to give input um, that a methodologist may not see and, and vice versa. So coming to a consensus there would be helpful in terms of the process, given that the process is reasonably subjective. And we do ask that risk of bias assessment isn't an afterthought and that it's integral to the process of your Cochrane and indeed non-Cochrane review. Um, and that it's not kind of done at the end in a hurry because it's something you have to do. Um, it is actually obviously quite important and can in influence you, the findings, um, the overall findings of your review quite substantially. So it's something that should be taken quite seriously. So before we go any further and start delving into the practical example, it's really important that we think about what is bias and that we're all on the same page in terms of um, what, what, what a bias is or is not. So a bias is a systematic error or deviation from the truth. So there's this saying where people say garbage in and garbage out. If a number of your studies are giving inaccurate estimates of effects or inaccurate results, this can obviously lead to misleading reviews or results for your review. And the main question you should be asking yourself when you're assessing risk of bias is, can I believe the results that I have? It's important to note that bias is not the same as imprecision. So it's not random error due to sampling. It's not the same as quality. So you shouldn't be asking the question, was this study conducted at high quality? It may be that the investigators did the best that they could with the constraints that they have. For example, a surgical trial may be of the, high, the highest quality that it can be, but you cannot blind it. So there is still potential for risk of bias with those types of studies. And it's not an issue of reporting. So this method may or may not have been done, but this is poor reporting. We're really at 
at a loss really in terms of risk of bias assessment. Another note about quality scales and checklists. Um, Agnes Deschart published uh, last year in, the, in Annals um, a, a paper looking at how quality in randomized controlled trials is assessed and identified many different ways, over 26 different ways of um, assessing risk of bias or quality in um, primary studies. Uh, within Cochrane reviews, we suggest that quality scales should not be used. Um, PT Uni has some empirical evidence which suggests that scales, the results of using scales and aggregate scores may be misleading. Um, so, so we're kind of working within that framework. Although that makes it slightly more challenging to assess if you don't have a, a summary score or some summary value, it makes it a little bit challenging to assess which studies are at higher risk of bias compared to others. Um, but this, this is a complex process and obviously time and thought needs to go into it and summarising is, um, is not beneficial for us. So what about the Cochrane Risk of Bias Assessment? There are seven evidence-based domains, and I think that's a really important point to, to reiterate, is that all of the domains in the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool, with the exception to attrition bias currently, um, are evidence-driven. So there are meta-epidemiological studies which result or have resulted in the potential for presence of a systematic error or deviation in the truth subject to a characteristic, i.e. blinding or sequence generation allocation concealment, for example. So what are the review author's judgments? So you go through each of these seven domains and then you judge at low, high or unclear risk as we're not scaling. So they're categorized. And then you give a support for the judgment. So these evidence will quotes from the paper or some sort of explanation that you've come up with, and then you input these into WebMan, or if you're not doing a Cochrane review, um, some sort of table uh, and appendices to add to your publication. These are the domains to address. Random sequence generation, allocation concealment, blinding of participants, participants and personnel. And if you're familiar with the tool, you may be aware that this has recently been split um, because we're trying to categorize by bias type. So it's been split into performance and detection bias. So for participants and personnel and blinding of outcome assessment. Incomplete outcome data, which is attrition bias. Selective reporting and other biases. And I underline selective reporting and other biases. As we'll touch on these briefly today, but we won't go into them in detail with regards to the example. Um, and they can be quite challenging to, to assess. And please consult the handbook, and there is far more explicit guidance than I can give today with regards to selective reporting and other biases. And as I did mention, we are doing work on selective reporting, and that may, may change in time to come in the way that we assess selective reporting. Does anybody have any questions at this time? Erin, um, perhaps, if, if there are one or two questions? Uh, if you can hear me now, can you please give a smiley face? Great. Okay. Good. So moving on, I don't, I don't think anybody else had any questions, and I apologise if um, 
if I missed any questions there, we seem to have a bit of a technical problem. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, please do always feel free to email if you have any questions or specific questions while um, you're con con conducting systematic review. So now let's move on to the example. Um, hopefully you have in front of you um, the randomized control trial that we, that we forwarded to everyone. It's quite a short um, RCT, that's why we picked it for this session. Um, it's looking at the effects of Tai Chi exercise um, on a number of different outcomes uh, for older women with osteoarthritis. It's an RCT, um, 72 patients were randomized to two arms, uh, the first arm uh, getting a 12 week, 12 weeks worth of sessions of Tai Chi um, and the other not, um, and they, they looked at before and after. Um, <clears throat> Uh, pre and post. So let's go through by the main. So you have the slides uh, for reference later when you go back through the slides if you need to. Um, we'll go through domain by domain and for each of the domains we'll have a poll and then for each of the domains we'll have any questions um, with regard to this RCT. So what is um, random sequence generation? It occurs at the start of the trial before the allocation of patients, and this avoids selection bias. So it determines the random order of assigning people into the intervention and control groups, and it avoids systematic differences between groups. How do we assess this? Um, so there's low and high risk, and I should probably say now that we're trying to encourage, so in 2009, Lisa Hartling um, at the University of Alberta published a study, um, and more recently there's been a recent paper, this published this year, um, that suggests that many of the tools that we use for assessing uh, bias, including the risk of bias, and um, there was also uh, Newcastle Ottawa, et cetera, um, are not hugely reliable, perhaps you could say it like that. Um, their cappers were found to be quite low, but especially across certain risk of bias tool domain. Uh, we don't find this surprising. Uh, by any means, especially because it's such a subjective process and it's a very localised process in terms of what you're doing for your systematic review and how you aim to reach consensus. However, we will be working on improving the guidance and if you do have any questions uh, at, at any stage, whenever, please do ask. If anything is at all unclear in the handbook or in the guidance available, please do let us know and we will try to improve that. But one suggestion that we are making at this time is that instead of rating unclear, it's at all possible to pick a, uh, to pick a judgment, so high or low. Um, we do find that a lot of people just kind of go for unclear, um, but it, hopefully we can improve that interrater reliability with low and high judgments. So low risk for random sequence generation would be uh, random number table, uh, computer random number generator, if they use a method of minimization or if they use stratified or block randomization, and also low tech um, options are available like coin tossing or shuffling cards, somehow to, to generate a sequence for randomization. High risk of bias is quasi-random, so date of birth or date of visit or ID record or something to that effect is not insufficient randomization. And non-random practice is also obviously not randomized sequence generation. Allocation concealment, it's again at the beginning of the trial and it avoids selection bias. But this is when people are recruited to the study and ensuring that no one knows which group that they've been allocated to. For low risk of bias, it has to be unpredictable. So central allocation or sequentially numbered sealed opaque envelopes. And high risk of bias means that someone on the staff or otherwise can predict the random sequence. So for example, if you generate this beautiful centrally randomized list of ones and zeros for allocations to arms and then somebody puts it up on the wall for which patient's coming in next. Obviously, that's high risk of bias for allocation concealment. 
So looking at the example, um, <clears throat> in, I just wanted to highlight the text in the paper. So this is under the methods section. It's the first paragraph in the methods section. Um, and it details that randomized process was conducted by a hospital coordination center using a randomized table uh, with no involvement of the research team. So this is now time for a poll. We'll do two polls. The first of which will be for sequence generation and the next one for allocation concealment. And please, uh, so we'll, let's do the first one first, the sequence generation. If you think it's at high risk of bias, please click A. Low risk of bias, B. Uh, C for unclear and D if you're a little bit unsure. Thank you, Anne. So B, low risk of bias. Oh, it's really getting up there now. Great. Great. Okay, and as I mentioned earlier, um, Lisa's study does suggest that there is some there is some variability and it is reasonably subjective here. And you will be doing it in duplicate with somebody else. So you know you can come to consensus about these responses and there is no, no, not necessarily a right or wrong answer. So what about allocation concealment? Um, again, high risk, low risk or unclear? We're a bit confused. Okay. So it's quite a few people saying low risk, a couple of people saying unclear, a couple of people are a little less confused, some people aren't voting. Okay. So selection bias. If we're looking at sequence generation, um, they've used a hospital coordination centre. So if you go back and perhaps look at the Cochrane Handbook, there's a table in there, and um, for low risk of bias, um, coordination by a centralised means of randomisation was deemed to be low risk of bias. Allocation concealment, um, as there is no involvement of the research team, and they've reported this, sometimes it's, it's often not reported, um, this is also low risk of bias. So they've implied here that there's no way that people will be able to know um, the sequence that's been generated. So the allocation has been concealed to the research team. So that is why we've decided that that's low risk of bias for allocation concealment, and sequence generation is also low risk of bias. Does anybody have any questions? No? Okay, and if you suddenly do decide, of, um, of course, at any time you do have questions um, about selection bar, please do um, get in touch. So moving on to the next domain, which is blinding of participants and personnel. So this is performance bias. So performance bias is different treatment of, in, um, of intervention groups. It's different participant expectations, and it can lead to changes in your actual outcomes. Blinding can be really challenging to assess. Um, sometimes it's not reported and the language is really vague. Like what does single blinding mean? What does double, double blinded randomized placebo control trial? Um, people often like to put those in their titles, um, thinking that it will get them published, but it doesn't actually, they don't actually go on to explain what that actually means. So that comes back to our issues with reporting. So it's important when we're assessing blinding to try and decipher what is meant by single or double blinding, who is actually blinded. It's also important and hardly ever reported um, to assess whether or not you think there's a potential for blinding to have been broken. So that's something else to think about. And it's also important to consider that even if it's not feasible uh, for this intervention. So the example again of the surgical trials. There's still a potential for risk of bias, but just because they, they can't blind the surgical intervention uh, doesn't mean that the potential for bias doesn't exist. 
So for performance bias for participants and personnel, low risk of bias is that there was blinding, that blinding occurred, and that it is unlikely that blinding could have been broken. And also, it's very important to consider subjective and objective outcomes uh, for both blinding domains. So if blinding, there wasn't any blinding, or the blinding was incomplete or broken in some way, if you have an objective outcome, for example, mortality, um, it's very unlikely that this will influence the, the, the results or result in a systematic deviation from the truth with regards to bias. So high risk of bias is there's no blinding, the blinding is incomplete or it's been broken, and it's a subjective outcome or in some way the outcome is likely to be influenced because of the lack of blinding. So as I just touched upon, for both performance and detection bias, so <clears throat> for outcome assessors and for uh, participants and personnel, so those two blinding domains, it's important that you assess by outcome. So it's important that you consider your outcomes or potentially a class of outcomes. For example, if your outcomes are all treated in the same manner, um, so as, as with this example, uh, for example, we can, we can look at physical components as a class of outcomes um, and, and think about those separately, as some may be subjective and some may be more objective outcomes, and the influence of lack of blinding will differ based on your outcome. Oh, and the, the bottom point does notice uh, that in Revman, you are able to design your table for more outcomes. So if you would like to look at all your primary outcomes or classes of outcomes, you can modify the, the risk of bias tables within Revman to accommodate that. So this is poll three. Um, what do you think about performance bias overall? Please vote. Uh, high is uh, A, low risk of bias is B, C is unclear risk of bias, and D if you're, you're still a bit confused. Just wait a couple of, of seconds here. Okay, so most people think it's at high risk of bias, some at low risk of bias, some people are still unclear, and, and a couple of people are still a little bit confused. So we'll try and reiterate here with the, with the example. So <clears throat> there's no caption uh, for this domain in particular. So if we think about who has been blinded, there's no information in the RCT, but if we think about the intervention, the patients know whether or not, it's like a surgical trial, the patients know whether or not they've been doing Tai Chi for 12 weeks. So um, it's very difficult to blind the patient um, as this is a, a change in their exercise behavior. And also the care providers um, who are administering the exercise program, um, they are also not blinded. And again, just to reiterate, it's important that we think about our outcomes here. So the self-reported subjective outcome, so the WMAP score, and the physical performance, which is slightly more objective. So we, as a BMG uh, convenership, when we came to do this together and talk about this, we came up with unclear risk of bias simply because we found that it wasn't reported um, and they haven't given us any information about potential contamination. So people that have been in the placebo group not taking any exercise and that have thought slightly more um, and moved on and they started taking up exercise themselves, although there is a statement in the method uh, section which stipulates that they were telephoned um, to make sure that they weren't doing uh, any exercise, but this hasn't been reported in the results, so we don't actually know uh, whether or not people have taken up exercise. So we thought this was this was somewhat um, unclear in terms of co-interventions and contamination.
But if you if you thought it was low risk of bias or uh, high risk of bias for whatever reason, as long as you report your judgment and your rationale, uh, this is this is all we can do. It's, it's a fairly subjective process, and my opinion today might be different from my opinion tomorrow, dependent on what side of bed I wake up on. Um, and that may dis differ from, from your opinion as well. So that's why we, again, why we do it in pairs and try to come to consensus. And there is no right or wrong answers. Does anybody have any questions at this stage? David. Hi, Lucy. Sorry, everybody, for the difficulty with the connection earlier. There are a couple of questions that have come through the chat room. We have a question from Robin asking, what if someone gets a different later treatment because of lack of blinding and the later over affects, affects the overall survival? What if someone gets a different later treatment because of lack of blinding and the later affects the overall survival? Lucy, could you answer that? I think so. I, I hope I've understood this correctly. So, but I'm, but I'm sorry, Erin, I'm not too sure why someone would receive a later treatment due to lack of blinding. So, um, but d with regards to performance or more so detection bias, if there's a difference between in the way that the intervention was um, administered or some sort of difference between groups that would provide unbalance, I think you should include that in other potential risk of bias section. I don't think it would necessarily fit um, in, into performance bias per se, um, but I think you could definitely include that if somebody, if there was a difference between the groups, so if for some reason um, there was a delay in the intervention um, in one of the groups compared to the other groups, um, or even within a subset of the population, I would include that in other, other risk of bias. I hope that is um, uh, somewhat helpful. Thanks very much, Lucy. And Robin, certainly if you had any further questions about that, please do feel free to email Lucy and she can answer that offline. There's another question online, Lucy, from David, who has asked, if blinding is not possible, how do we express our judgment? So for example, if the intervention is a housing assistance, it's impossible to blind. Do we still say high risk? There's no not applicable option. Lucy. Hi, David. No, no there, there isn't a not applicable um, option. And if you believe that blinding may influence the outcome, so say there's a subjective outcome, for example, um, housing is provided by the state, and how does that make the tenants um, feel? for example, some sort of self-reported subjective outcome um, after they have moved in, um, I would say yes. Um, if, if you can't blind for that, then there, there would be a potential to influence the outcome. Um, and therefore, I would, I would deem it high risk of bias for that study. Uh, bias can still occur if the quality of the study was the best that it could be, um, given the, the the context and, and the question in hand. And if there's no potential way to blind, um, the potential risk of bias can still exist. Thank you, Lucy. There's a further question in the room. Um, the last one so far from Lako asking, for dividing outcomes into subjective and objective, are you referring to the schema offered by Leslie Wood's BMJ paper in 2008? Is there additional guidance out there? Hi, Lucky. Um, glad, glad that you could join us today. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here. Yes, that's a, that, that is definitely um, based on the empirical evidence of the Woods uh, BMJ paper that was published in 2008. Um, in terms of additional um, guidance, there are a number of um, references that I should. I, I'm not my memory is awful. Um, out. Um, AKL from last year published one. Um, and Asbjorn and Isabel have also done a lot of work on blinding. Um, I will get the personal blinding references or most up to date ones for for you and, and send them 
send them to the group. I hope I hope that's helpful. Erin, are there any other questions? Those are all the questions in the room right now. Thanks, Lucy. Great, thank you everybody. And um, I do know that a couple of people are still a little bit unclear. Um, and in the interest of time, um, we'll, ca we'll carry on at this stage and there will be more opportunity for questions as we go. Um, if there's anything that's still baffling after the session, uh, please, please do get, involved, uh, get in touch. So moving on to the next domain is blinding of outcome assessment. So uh, participants and personnel are performance bias and outcome assessment, blinding of outcome assessment is detection bias. So it's the measurement of outcomes affected by knowledge of the intervention received. And again, it's very similar um, issues with performance bias with regards to the wording of single and double blinding. Um, and it may be feasible um, that there is detection bias even when um, blinding of first participants and care providers is, is not possible. Um, and you should remember that participants and personnel um, may also be outcome assessors. So that's something to bear in mind for this um, RCP. So low risk of bias, very similar domain. Um, to performance bias is that blinding um, has occurred and it's unlikely to be a broken or that there's no blinding um, but they're very objective outcomes um, so your outcome measures are not likely to be influenced by lack of blinding so for example mortality um, you know if, if there's no blinding um, and the ma major outcome for a surgical trial is mortality then the influence of blinding may not have um, a greater effect and that can be deemed low risk of bias. High risk of bias is no blinding or broken blinding and the measurement is likely to be influenced, so self-reported or subjective outcomes. Uh, blinding of outcome assessment. So this is what we have in our RCT, in our song RCT that we have. Um, it's under the data collection procedure subheading in the method section. So all subjects attended a sports centre of University Hospital for pre and post test measures of balance, muscle strength and cardiovascular functioning by uh, exercise physiologists using blind procedures. It's time for two more polls. Uh, the first poll, I'm sorry that quite quick and a lot to digest in one go. Uh, please feel free not to vote if, if you're uncomfortable. Uh, so please vote on detection bias. And if, for this one, we're going to break it up by outcome. So the WOMAP score is self-reported and fairly subjective. Uh, do you think that this is high, low, or unclear risk of bias? Okay, a bit slower on these ones, that's okay. Okay, a little bit more split, um, very evenly split actually, um, between high, low and unclear for the women's scores. Um, what about for the physical performance, the more objective scores, what do you think for detection bias? Don't forget to think about who is the outcome assessor and um, whether or not they're objective or subjective outcomes. So D, low risk of bias. Okay, a little bit more on the low risk of bias uh, for the objective outcome, which is which is good to see, and uh, the subjective outcome with a little bit more uh, diversity across the group there. Okay, so if we're thinking about who was the outcome assessor, this is the patient for this one, as it's self-reported. They're assessing their outcomes and they weren't blinded. It's also a very subjective outcome, so I would list this as high risk of bias. For physical performance, these are a little bit more um, objective, 
Um, and the outcome assessor were uh, the physiologists, and they were blinded, and it was using a standardized measure set. And I can see everybody sitting uh, at their computers thinking, oh, risk of bias. Um, the blinding procedure was questionable. They didn't give us any details about the blinding procedure. Um, but these outcomes are more objective. I wouldn't say they were specifically objective. Um, so there's been debate within um, the BMG executive. Some of us would say unclear, and um, some of us would say low, and some of us would say high risk of bias. So I think it depends. Um, on your standpoint and whether or not you think um, it would influence the physical performance results. It was actually interesting that the clinicians in our group went for more high risk of bias and the methodologists in our group went for more low risk of bias. So as I say, um, there's no right or wrong answer um, to this. And if you're ever in doubt, please feel free to, to have a chat with us. And um, if you went for low risk of bias, that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, having said that, it's probably more beneficial to err on the, on, on the side of caution. Does anybody have any questions about outcome assessment? No? Not there are a couple of people just typing in, Lucy, so we'll just give them a second to write in. We've had one question come in asking, what is the reference for the new Cochrane categories for assessing risk of bias? High, low. I've checked the book and it's not there yet. A couple of other questions that have also come through asking, in performing risk of bias assessment, would you ever contact authors to ask for further details or just assess based on information reported? Thank you, participant 51. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think that's completely up to you, um, your time frame, your funding, um, and particularly how many studies you have um, included in your systematic review. Um, if you only have three or four, it's it's perfectly feasible to get in touch with them. If you, you have 100 or 200 or 400, I know that doesn't happen very often, but if you do, um, then contacting authors may not be the optimal way to go, but it is perfectly acceptable. Um, we've had some internal conversations within our KS group recently about how many times it's acceptable to contact an author if you get non-response for them. Um, we decided it was only twice. Um, and I think it also depends on how old the study is as well. If you're including studies from the 80s or even the 90s, um, the, the likelihood that you'll be able to get in touch with the, the author and that they would have accurate information for you may not be 100% um, reliable or, or even feasible. But um, otherwise, I, I think, yeah, it's perfectly acceptable to, to get in, in touch with trialists and authors and ask them uh, about their studies. Thanks, Lucy. Another question that came through the room asked, I think that outcome assessment is easier when we have a tool or a scale. Do you think that's true? We'll just give a moment for Lucy to come through. Thank you, sorry, I unclicked my, myself. Um, yes, I do believe it's easier um, to have a scale, and I, I do also believe it's easier to have a summary scale. And there's a, a lot of discussion within the BMG at the moment um, around summarizing risk of bias and to, to make it a little bit more digestible, both for authors and for clinicians in terms of interpretation. And it is fairly messy practice. But although it's easier to have a summary score, that's almost implying that there's equal weighting by domain. So you're saying that sequence generation has a similar weighting in terms of potential effects on your results as performance bias or detection bias. 
which may indeed not be true, dependent on the context of your review. Um, lack of blinding may have a huge influence on your results in your systematic review, um, whereas you know, selective reporting or another type of risk of bias would have a major impact on your systematic review. Um, so the scaling, give, giving equal weight to each domain is um, unrealistic and can be potentially misleading in, in my opinion. Thanks, Lucy. There's one last question that's come through the room from David asking, when you're personally not sure and you're hesitating, so for example, between unclear and high risk, do you tend to be more conservative or do you tend to give them the benefit of the doubt? Hmm. Uh, that's a really good question and I think it depends, um, as I mentioned earlier, on how I feel on the day. If I'm in a bad mood, I'll probably get high risk of bias, um, to be honest, but hopefully um, the person that I'm working with in duplicates in a better mood. Um, I would be more conservative, yes. I would tend to go for more high risk of bias than low risk of bias. I think there's been a tendency from across the board from authors um, not to mark high risk of bias. And it's not a slight against the author. It's got nothing to do with the quality or the conduct of the trial. Um, it's, it's not a personal attack by any means to label somebody's results potentially at high risk of bias for the results of your review within the context of the question that you're asking. Um, so yes, I would um, be more conservative. And depending on the feel for the paper, um, I, I wouldn't give the benefit of the doubt if I'm brutally honest. Thanks, Lucy. There are a couple of more questions that comes that have come through. Um, I wonder if uh, if you'd like to continue at this point, and we'll save Marie and Juan's questions to the end, if that's okay. Lucy, what do you think? Yeah, perfectly okay. So I've just realised the time, and um, we we should get a move on. Um, thank you, then. I will take those questions um, later on. So incomplete outcome data. So this is attrition bias. So attrition can happen for many reasons. So it's when complete outcome data for all participants is not available in your review. So there's lots of follow-up, there's withdrawals, people have moved, um, there's other reasons for missing data or people have been excluded. Um, so some data that should be available is not included in the report. And this all leads to attrition bias. There's no empirical evidence for attrition bias at the moment, but um, Logically, it, it makes sense if there's been some proportion of your um, trial participants that have dropped out for whatever those reasons may be, um, if there's differences between groups, there's some sort of imbalance, this could result in a systematic error in the results for this study and then within subsequently within your systematic review. So things to consider for attrition bias. How much data is missing for each of the groups? Why is it missing? So are the reasons for exclusion or withdrawal or loss of follow-up are the missing data um, given, provided? And is there an imbalance between the group two groups? And how is the data analyzed? One of the biggest questions and problems that we have with assessing risks of bias is how much is too much missing data. And this year, um, last month actually, um, Yelena Savovich, who's a very active bias methods group member um, in collaboration with, with many others, published the Brando report. So they're looking at bias characteristics. So the compilation of all the meta-epidemiological work that is out there, so the empirical evidence that drives why we assess bias, and what bias domains we assess. And they were looking at attrition bias. So they took a cut point of 20% and found that there was no systematic error um, with regards to the bias results, uh, with regards to the results for individual studies. So there's no simple rule in terms of how much is too much missing data. Maybe it's not 20%. At the moment, we just don't know. Um, it's very difficult to, to assess that. So what you have to do is, is there missing data that can meaningfully affect the results of your study? 
So the overall proportion of missing data, the event risk, so for the cosmic outcomes, um, how much that would change um, your event risk. So for example, if you have rare events um, and there, there's a, a large number of dropouts, what would that, that mean? How would that influence your results? Um, and the plausible effect size, very similar. Um, reasons related to the study outcomes. So um, was it an adverse event? Was there a refusal? What were the reasons for refusal? Um, is there a certain demographic of population that's refusing to participate? And the missing data or reasons were not balanced between the two groups. So one group, the intervention group, had a severe number of withdrawals due to adverse events, and the control group didn't. For example, that could be a, a potential for attrition bias. So I'm just going to quickly skim over intention to treat analysis. Um, please reflect upon this uh, while, while doing your assessments. Um, and assessing incomplete data, it may be difficult to reach the conclusion, uh, as I mentioned. So low risk of bias is no missing data. Um, the reason for missing data is um, not related to the outcome. There's missing data um, and there's an imbalance between uh, groups. Uh, there's a balance between the groups, so the reasons are similar. I apologize, this is low risk of bias. The proportion of missing or plausible effect size is not enough to have a clinically relevant effect. And the high risk of bias are somewhat converse to those reasons. So the re reasons for attrition are related to the outcome and that there's an imbalance um, in the numbers for the reasons between arms. The proportion of missing or plausible effect size is enough to have a clinically relevant effect. As treated analysis was conducted, um, with substantial departure from the allocation. Uh, we can talk about that at a different stage. Um, and inappropriate use of in imputations with regards to their analysis. So with regards to our randomized control trial example, if we look, 42 female participants were randomized. There was dropout rates of 43% and 39% in the experimental and control groups, respectively. So what do you guys think about this in terms of what we're thinking about with regards to proportion of dropout? There were also reasons given uh, for dropout, but they don't specify which groups um, have the reasons for the dropout, so it's impossible for us to determine balance uh, for the reasons of dropout. And uh, here's, here's just a table. Um, where they've finally done their analysis on pre and post available data, which is for 22 and 21 um, in, in the exercise in the control arm, given that 72 were randomized. So what do you guys think? This is the, the final poll. Do you think it's a high risk of bias for A, low risk of bias for B, C is unclear risk of bias, and D, I apologize if you're, you're still a bit unsure. And it, it's not easy to tell. Wait for those to come in. High risk of bias. Quite a few people. Okay, great. Many people are saying high risk of bias, few unclear, um, and also a few are low, which is which is fine. We determined that we thought it was high risk of bias purely on the percentage of dropout. So although it was reasonably balanced between both arms in terms of the, the number of people who withdrew from the study, um, we thought that it was at high risk of bias uh, for, incomplete, for incomplete outcome data, just due to the sheer number of people who dropped out. Just to touch very quickly upon selective reporting. Um, selective reporting can lead to reporting biases. This is where there's a difference between what has been planned in detail, reported on clinicaltrials.gov or in the, in the study protocol, with what has been reported um, in, in the final publication. This is incredibly challenging um, to assess as a risk of bias item, and there is work going on around selective reporting to try and improve the guidance and help people with this. 
Um, but if we don't have the protocol or um, the, the registered trial available to us, it's very difficult to determine what has been done. And that's an issue of um, a reporting issue as opposed to um, means of assessing selective reporting. So many of um, the judgments are unclear. And although we try to encourage people to steer clear of unclear um, judgments, um, with regards to selective reporting, it's very common to have um, unclear risk of bias with the judgment. Let's see. So those are just the main seal reps. So just one quick thought. Um, I noticed that we're hitting 1 o'clock, and I recognize that some people are going to need to leave the room. Just to let everybody know that we will be sending through a copy of the slides, and we'll also follow up with an, an evaluation form by email. So if you do need to leave, if you have another commitment, um, please don't worry about missing some, some of the content. We will follow up with uh, by passing that along. Sorry, Lucy. No, not at all. Thank you, Erin. And I'm very sorry that we've that we've run over time. Um, and I do hope that you have chance to refer to the to the PDF of the slides. And if you do have any questions or anything that we haven't covered that you're not not able to to carry on listening to, please do um, let me know. Thank you very much for for those who have to to leave. There's also a section in the Cochrane Handbook on other sources of bias. Um, it should be important to note that these do not include imprecision, so uh, small sample size, um, that, that is not a potential risk of bias. Um, an adequate dose or an unusual population, so diversity or heterogeneity, that is not a potential risk of bias. And other measures of quality, so whether or not there was ethics approval or how funding was obtained, that's a big one, um, but they're not other sources of bias at this stage. Um, there are three uh, potential issues that the BMG is investigating at the moment um, with regards to trials which have been stopped early for benefits. Um, the difference between single centre and multi-centre trials and whether there's a difference in measures of effect. Um, and we're also looking at source of funding. So those are outstanding issues which are not necessarily sources of bias and should not be considered at this time in the risk of bias tool as, as it stands. Just for means of time. This is an example of the risk of bias table in RevMap. So these domains on, on this side, on the left hand side where it says bias with a heading underneath which you can modify these and, and change them as you wish. Um, based on, on the guidance that's provided. And then the author's judgment is where you include your high, your low, or your unclear, and the support from judgment, which should be completed. And now in line with the Messier standards, um, methodological expectations for Cochrane interventions reviews, which is published and is available on the Cochrane website, um, it's mandatory uh, to complete risk of bias tables um, in this form for Cochrane reviews. There are two figures um, which are produced in Redman uh, to give a nice overview of the risk of bias assessment. These are our ways of summarizing without a scale, without a summary score. Um, so the, the green is low risk of bias, the red is high risk of bias. Um, so it's a nice sort of graphical illustration. Um, and this one's fairly similar. Where you see is white. This is where someone has uh, negated to uh, in include that uh, assessment. They haven't, they haven't included that one there. So this is, this is what we can do in terms of, of summarizing. Some questions that we currently have within the BMG are, should this be done by outcome? So should we be looking at overall risk of bias assessments by outcome rather than by study? And should we be weighting these? For example, um, these are kind of equally distributed for each of the studies. So it may be interesting to weight those based on sample size, or perhaps there's, there's another way to do that. So that's one of the questions that we currently have at the moment. There are a couple of slides here, and for, for the um, for time, um, I'll quickly go over these, but not in too much detail. So incorporating your findings into your review, this is incredibly challenging, um, and not many people do it. And one, one of the big 
kind of marketing campaigns, not really, but one of the big drives at the moment is to try and encourage people um, to include a description or descriptive narrative description of um, risk of bias across domains in a shorter summary as they can in their discussion section. But this may be missed and it doesn't um, consider the impact on your results. So it, it may be possible for you to restrict your primary analysis to low risk of bias and have a look. Um, you can always conduct sensitivity analysis to see if risk of bias assessment influences your meta-analysis, a little bit harder for, for qualitative synthesis. Um, you can always present a stratified analysis and you can also explore by subgroup analyses or methodological meta-regression um, if you feel so inclined and particularly if you have a large number of included studies. You can prioritise domains in your review, as we said earlier. For example, in some studies, blinding may have a large impact, or you would perceive it having a large impact on your results. Um, and it's important to try and think about the potential direction of the impact. So, has this bias, um, this bias due to lack of blinding, taken my measure of effect towards or away? from the null. And this can take some thought and time. So it's important that risk of bias just isn't a mandatory um, inconvenient step and that you actually give time to thinking, okay, so I've got these risk of bias assessments, I've got my outcomes, I've got my summaries across and this very large study is high risk of bias for selective um, for selective reporting. What does that mean? Um, how has that influenced my results in which direction? And reaching an overall interpretation. Uh, apologies to Rush there at the end. Um, does anybody have any questions? Thank you very much, Lucy. There are a couple of questions that we had from the last question session. Um, we had a question from Marie who asked, if you contact an author, and they provide a response that alters your rating of bias. Do you somehow flag this in the table, or do you just mm -hmm. score it accordingly? Um, it's, it's very up to you. I would encourage um, transparency. Um, so I would definitely encourage um, you to report that the author had responded to the questions that you had. Um, and I would definitely update the rating accordingly. Um, but you could also note that in the judgments or um, in the characteristics table. So the characteristics Thank you. Table. Thank you. We also have a question from Juan who asked, when assessing the overall risk of bias of the meta-analysis, do all individual trials weigh the same, no matter the size or other characteristics? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And um, so I did rush through that at the end. They do uh, currently take on all of the, the the same weighting and they're not grouped by outcome. So it, it's across studies and that's something that is important for authors to consider um, when they're assessing that they're risk of bias by outcome and also um, by, by trial weighting. Um, I agree and I think we will be moving in that direction that um, obviously the impact within a, a weighted meta-analysis is that larger trials will generally have a, a greater weight and therefore the, their influence on the pooled estimate of effect is greater and therefore any potential risk of bias will influence your estimate of effect more dramatically uh, for quantitative analysis. So yes, it's important to think about um, um, weighting across study by outcome. Thank you. Erin, are there any more questions? Thanks, Lucy. There are indeed some other questions. Before we get to those, um, I just sent through the chat room an evaluation form. So there's a link to an evaluation form that if you could take just a couple moments to complete, we'd really appreciate that. We'll also be sending that link when we send the slides. Um, but if you could take a moment to complete it, we'd really appreciate your time. The other questions that we had, Lucy, were regarding the, um, uh, the source of funding. Lisa has asked, why would the source of funding not be a potential source of bias? Um, <laughs> this is a very common question. Thank you for asking. Um, the, 
current um, guidance is that it will be picked up in other process domains. So the source of funding itself doesn't necessarily result in a systematic error or deviation from the truth, and that this will be picked up by signature generation, lack of binding, or um, most importantly, potentially selective reporting. Um, but no, itself is not um, currently a factor within the risk of bias tool. There will be some work going on to that, but I, I think that's, that's pretty hard and fast um, rule, and it was really interesting, Yelena, um, who, who published the uh, Brando study this year, who works quite closely with the BMG, also um, took all of the risk of bias assessments from across all the Cochrane reviews and looked at the others, and a huge proportion of um, reviews are including so, uh, source of funding as an other uh, risk of bias, and we kind of find it within our mandate to kind of put the, the word out there that it's not in itself an explicit source of bias or an other source of bias. But it's, it's definitely something that you can report. Uh, definitely not saying it's something that shouldn't be reported, but it's not necessarily an explicit potential for a systematic error in your estimate of effect. I hope that's clear. Uh, if not, please let me know. I'll try and give another um, explanation, maybe written explanation. Thank you for raising that. Thanks very much, Lucy. A couple of other questions that came through. There's a software named Gate that is designed for assessing the risk of bias. How do you feel about using that? I have never heard of this software. Sorry, can you, re you repeat that, Erin? What's, what's the software called? Certainly, the software is called Gate, as in something you use to keep your horses in. Gate, designed for assessing oh. the risk of bias. And it's designed by Professor Rod Jackson. Rod Jackson. OK. Uh, I have not heard about that. That hasn't been done um, in conjunction with the, the BMG. And I don't believe it's been in, done in conjunction with the risk of bias tool developers. I could definitely ask Julian and Jonathan, the other BMG um, executive members, if, if they've heard of it. Um, I'll try and find out what the scoop is on, on this software and uh, update everybody with the, with the blinding references. But sorry, I don't know if I... Thanks very much, Lucy. Um, Nasima, if you wouldn't mind uh, sending that through to us, um, if you could send that through to either uh, Lucy's email or through to the Canadian Cochrane Center, um, we'd really appreciate that reference. Thank you. And the last question. Um, we have a question from Marijal wondering if it was a, if we're wondering about Grade Pro. Are we talking about Grade Pro, perhaps? Oh, okay. There's a question wondering perhaps the software is Grade Pro. Oh, maybe. Are we perhaps thinking about Grade Pro? Just a thought, just a thought. And I believe those are all of our questions. Um, oh, sorry, Odette has written in, can we assess the risk of bias without Rasman? Yes, and, and uh, many, many people do, and it's, um, uh, you can just take the domains um, and include them in an Excel spreadsheet, for example, in conjunction with your data extraction form, um, and assess risk of bias as, as high, low, and unclear using filters in, in Excel. Quite in a quite straightforward way, and also Redman is um, is free for everybody to use. So you don't have to be a Cochrane author to go to the Cochrane website. Um, if you search in the search um, bar in on the Cochrane website, Redman, you can download download the Redman software, update your studies into that, and you can do your meta analysis and um, produce your risk of bias figures if you want to include them in a non-Cochrane review. Um, it's, free, it's free for everybody to use. It's really good. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, I believe that that's all of our questions. Could I ask everybody to send through a round of applause? A round of applause to thank Lucy for taking the time today to present. Lucy, we really appreciate you being available.
and it would be marvelous um, if you wouldn't mind responding to those questions. I'd be happy to send through any responses to anybody who joined today's webinar. Again, we'll also be sending through a copy of the slides, and we'll be sending through a link to that evaluation form again. So thank you very much to everybody for, for participating. We really appreciate you joining us, and we hope you join us in a couple of weeks on December 11th for our next webinar on Prisma and the Equity Extension. So we hope you can join us for that. Thank you so much for your time, everybody.